This is a production of Cornell University. Uh, good afternoon. I'm Garrett Blaylock. I'm an assistant professor in the department. And today, it is my pleasure to welcome you to the second of AIM's new C, or current event, seminar series. Today, to introduce uh, the guest speaker, I'd like to ask uh, AIM Ambassador Antonio Singleton to come to the podium and get us started, please. Good afternoon. I'd like to welcome you all to the second installment of the CE series. We hope you enjoyed the first. Today we're in for a treat. We have Professor David Juss, who will be talking about behavioral economics and what we eat. Professor Juss's areas of expertise include risk and uncertainty, information and behavioral economics. His research interests center around the use of information, and more particularly, how differences in human capital, capital and information availability affect our decisions today. In addition, Professor Just teaches AIM 4110, Introduction to Econometrics, AIM 4140, Behavioral Economics and Managerial Decisions, AIM 6120, Applied Econometrics, and AIM 7020, Applied Market Economics II. Without further ado, please help me welcome Professor David Just to the podium. Thank you very much, and, and thanks for the opportunity, Garrick, to be able to present this. This is a somewhat different audience than I'm used to presenting this material in, so you're going to have to excuse me if I may pitch it a little bit high once in a while. So I, I, we are going to try and hold questions till the end, but if you catch me saying something that just doesn't make sense to you because I haven't defined the term, please raise your hand and stop me and force me to clarify. Uh, I, I want this to be something applicable and, and understandable. Um, so, to begin with, just to, to kick this off, as you're all aware, obesity has become a really big issue in the U.S., but not just the U.S. Uh, here, the rates of obesity have increased substantially over the last 20 years among first the poor and then among the more wealthy. And now it really does seem to be pervasive in all demographics. No matter what, how much you make, no matter what race you may belong to or what gender you may be, there has been a substantial increase in obesity. And we've seen the same increase in obesity in other countries. In some countries, what we may consider to be developing countries even, we're seeing the similar increase. So what's, what's the reason behind this? And there are a great number of researchers trying to look at this and find this, this you know, um, silver bullet that tells us what is causing this increase in obesity. Uh, I'm not one of those. <laughs> Uh, rather, I want to see what sorts of things we can do on the margin to help improve. Part of the problem with going for such a silver bullet approach is that you can't find a single thing. There have been a whole confluence of factors that really did this. Um, some of the work that's been pointed out that, uh, that, that's interesting, food has become less expensive over the period of time we're talking about. Dronowski and Darman is probably the most common reference talking about this. They, they show in particular that dollars spent per calorie has declined substantially and that they think this leads people to consume more. In particular, it makes the more price sensitive consume more calories and increase their, uh, their girth, their weight. A um, little bit of a problem I have with this is that we, we really don't think prices are all that uh, important in how much people buy. And, if this really is the case, if this is really what's driving it, well, over the last year, we've, due to ethanol policies and rising in oil prices and things like that, we've seen a huge increase in the price of corn and, and hence corn syrup and things like that uh, due to the growth of India and China and their demand for, uh, for grains, for feed, for their cattle, things like that. If that's really the problem, we may see the obesity problem just disappear in the next couple of years, and I have my doubts. So, uh, so I'm continuing this research agenda despite that. Uh, other reasons, uh, there have been fewer reasons to be physically active. More people own cars. More people uh, have access to um, video games, computers, entertainment that's right there on demand. So potentially people are spending less time doing physical activities. And there's been a long, lot of research along those lines as well. Uh, what I'm going to focus on is really this last point, is that the methods of marketing foods have really become a lot more sophisticated. Our research methodology, uh, the types of 
innovative practices that marketers are trying are really getting to be different, substantially different. They have a better understanding of what they're doing, and potentially that has an impact on how much people are eating. So to sort of frame this, uh, I want to start by thinking about this as a standard economist would. Uh, now, I, I suppose most of you have had your, your basic principles courses, and you know that economists are very high on the idea of rationality, that people have full information, that they make good use of this information and have these, you know, these deliberative decisions that they make that maximize their own well-being. Well, if people are maximizing their own well-being, what are the, what are the sort of limits that they face? Well, they have uh, you know, a certain amount of income. They can't really spend beyond that, uh, at least not anymore. Um, <laughs> we also have uh, certain limits on our information, the, the understanding we have of the health uh, implications of the food we're eating. And we have limits on our time that's available to prepare these foods. And these are really important, uh, you know, variables in uh, the, the decisions to make food and what sorts of things to eat. But given this sort of model, what are the policy implications? Well, the policy implications are primarily that we can either alter the prices, we can alter the, the wealth of people, which is, is difficult and politically uh, not feasible, or we can change the amount of information people have. Beyond that, the most we could do is actually to change the types of food that are available, actually bar and ban different types of food, which is also uh, politically unfeasible uh, in most cases. And this has been, you know, primarily the approach we've seen is more information, more health information, giant information campaigns, and no matter how much they spend on it, uh, you know, from a government standpoint, it's a drop in the bucket compared to how much advertising dollars are coming out telling us about how great McDonald's foods are and how great the other foods that are out there are, it, it's just not going to turn, stem the tide. It's not going to change things, right? And I'm going to argue that this sort of thinking about food relies very heavily on what I'm going to call dubious rationality assumptions. First one I mention is free disposal, okay? Free disposal. This is the idea that I get to choose exactly how much I'm going to eat. No matter how much food is sitting in front of me, I can throw away the rest, and it doesn't cost me anything. Okay? Now, a personal fact about me, I've, I have four children. So I've, I've spent 36 months of my life with a pregnant woman. And because you probably don't know this, pregnant women eat substantially more than most people, and they eat for longer periods of time than most people at least more than they usually do. And, and so you're sitting down at dinner, and you're, you, know, you finish what you would normally do, and your wife's still eating, and you're into the conversation. You can't just get up and walk away from her and go into a different room. That's a little bit obnoxious to do. Um, and you're sitting there, and you keep talking. After a little while, you notice there's that other roll sitting over on that plate, and it just sort of catches your eye, and you keep talking, and eventually you have to eat that roll. You just can't resist it that long. You cannot keep telling yourself, yeah, I'm already done. Because eventually, you ignore that, uh, you know, you, what you're telling yourself. You ignore that voice in your head, and you pick it up and you start eating. You don't have free disposal. It costs you something to be able to keep up that barrier, okay? Secondly, con continuity. Uh, so the idea is that people have these continuous quantity decisions, but really do we? You know, if, if you sit down you know, to what, take in the game on Saturday and you take a bowl of chips with you uh, and you're sitting there watching, each time you pick up a chip, are you sitting there thinking, okay, so what is the marginal cost of a chip? How much is this chip really costing me? And exactly what is it contributing to the amount of, you know, clogging in my arteries? Or do you just eat to the end of the bowl and then when you're at the, done with that bowl, think, should I get another one, right? <laughs> That's a different, different type of decision uh, rule, and it's, it's one that we've sort of assumed out of most of economics. So the argument for food psychology and economics, there's this substantial evidence that controlling our diet really does take effort. Okay? It requires a lot of expenditure of effort. And if we were really good economists and we had the possibility to observe, we could document how much effort this was and, and quantify it and improve our models and, and put out these rational models, but we don't have that ability. We can't really measure that effort very well. And because we can't do that, 
really all that's left is this idea of documenting through experimental psychology the trade-offs people make based on those costs and using those trade-offs trying to build models of what happens rather than talking about exactly why it happens. The question you have to ask yourself are have obese individuals made the conscious effort to become so? Okay? If it's a rational, if, if it's a rational model, then anybody who gets to the point where they're obese should not regret the fact that they are. They should not regret the actions that they've made, and they shouldn't have to pay others to try and help enforce their own decisions. Right? When we have a billion dollars, or several billion dollars actually, diet industry, it tells us that there's something irrational going on, that this doesn't quite fit the rational model. And if it's not the rational model, if it's not this deliberative decision that people have sat down and said, you know, I like food so much that I would like to weigh 287 pounds, right? If it's not that type of deliberative decision, then how can policies that are designed to appeal to highly conscious thought, things like changing the price, changing the health information, how are those ever going to address the problem? Because those only work for people who are thinking deliberatively, not people who are making gut instinct reactions or, or rules of thumb reactions. It's not going to address those individuals. So, little background. Um, we, we are in a, what was formerly a pure ag econ department. Um, and there's a long history in ag economics of looking at how people's response to price affects how much they eat. And there's essentially a 50-year history of finding that uh, it, it doesn't really change much at all. Okay? And in other words, we have to change prices on foods very substantially to get people to change their diets in a really big way. Uh, there are several people who have looked at the, exactly that. There's starting to be some studies saying that's a little more nuanced, in particular that some people are, uh, are more responsive to changes in prices for, say, vegetables than they are foods that are high in fat or salt or sugar, which means what? We can't put a fat tax on those particular foods and change much of what people eat. We might be able to lower the price of vegetables and have some impact on how much they eat in terms of vegetables, but that's just going to add more to what they're eating. It's not going to reduce what they're eating that's bad. And some of the reason why people aren't responsive to price, well, right now you probably are involved in almost every food transaction that you make. But the majority of people live in a household where there's one person who shops and they observe prices and nobody else does. And they may not have any clue when prices change, even substantially as they have in the last several months. They just might not know about it. If, if there's really that disconnection, prices may not be that important. Those sorts of policy solutions may not work very well. When, with, respect, uh, or, excuse me, with respect to information, there's a, a very well-developed marketing literature out there that tells us something pretty disappointing, in fact, that, that people don't pay much attention to health information that they prioritize convenience and taste when they're trying to buy. And in fact, convenience seems to be the biggest factor in what people buy, rather than that health information, no matter how hard we hammer it. People don't remember health information very long. No matter how we present the information, it takes it being repeated over and over and over again continually before people will start to understand it and use it. And it can be abused, right? I mean, the fact that people understand they shouldn't be consuming too much fat leads to a whole bunch of products out there that say low fat on them. But they say low fat and neglect to mention that they doubled the sugar so it tastes okay and you'll still eat it, right? They focus in on just a couple of little pieces of information and not the whole picture. They can't get to the level of detail they really need in order to make an improvement in people's diets. Okay, so bottom line, the traditional tools can have some influence on what people eat, but it's not going to be a big impact. It's not going to really change how much or what they eat unless we change prices beyond what's reasonable, unless we make big, big changes in the types of information campaigns we're going to engage in, those sorts of things. Um, I, I should mention here, well, I, I've got the point up here. A lot of times people will only latch on to health information that they find 
particularly agreeable with their own, uh, their own habits already. So people who tend to drink once in a while latch on to all the studies that say drinking is good for your heart. And they neglect the study, like the one that came out yesterday, that says it shrinks your brain. <laughs> okay? You tend to favor only those that really uh, reinforce what you're doing, not change what you're doing. You don't like information that's painful to uh, observe. Alternatively, behavioral economics relies on anomalies, rules of thumb, psychology. Okay? This has become a really big area of study in economics, primarily in the field of finance, believe it or not where people have all the resources in the world to make their decisions. And they have these you know, giant computer models that they can use to try and decide what sorts of, of investments they're going to, to buy and this, that, and the other. And we find big behavioral effects, big psychological impacts. If it's going to have an impact there, it is very likely it's also going to have an impact during a commercial break when you're just walking through your kitchen really fast. right? It's, it's not going to be something you have the ability to do to make perfectly rational decisions with food, the way these decisions are made. A lot of the problem, I'm going to suggest, is due to the fact that people can't monitor how much they consume. Okay? Factors that are going to make this task more difficult are going to make it so you consume more. You naturally consume more when you can't keep track of how much you're eating. And you naturally consume a little bit less when you do have some way of keeping track. Additionally, people tend to sort of distort how much they think they've eaten. There is a, a big difference, for example, in how much you think you've eaten when you take those, you know, that bowl of chips and sit and watch the game and how much you actually ate. That misperception by itself can account for a lot of calories and can account for a lot of bad behavior. Packaging and, and uh, Different sorts of ways that they package the food can impact exactly that, uh, that monitoring, right? So you've seen snack wells where they have, you know, 100-calorie packs of, of different sorts of items. Those are designed specifically for that, to try and get you to be able to recognize how much it is you're eating. This is a graphical way of representing how I would see this model, particularly if we're talking about consumption in the home. Now, we, we think there are a few things that I'll call primitive. These are things exogenous to the model. We have to take them as given, like habits, preferences, and wealth. Alternatively, the individual controls a lot of things, right? Within their own home, they control the lighting. They control who they're eating with. They control, um, you know, exactly where they eat, where the TV is located, things like that. And the manufacturer has some control as well. They control how big a box is they, they uh, sell their food in what sort of portion sizes they have, how it's marketed, different combinations of actual foods within their product, those sorts of things. And where we have different people controlling different types or different parts of the decision, this tells us that there's something sort of like a game going on. Okay? In other words, they're playing against each other. The marketer is trying to maximize profits, and they control all those little factors that they can. If we're talking about restaurants, of course, they control a lot more of those factors than the ones that I listed right there. But they control a certain number of those factors, and you control a certain number. The only interesting thing here that, that gets this beyond what would be sort of a normal sort of game is that the marketers, through experimentation and through their knowledge of research, are aware of how you respond to all these little, little changes that they make, subtle changes. And for the most part, people aren't. The consumer isn't. In other words, we may not recognize how their changes in marketing practices are affecting our behavior. We couldn't tell you what it's doing. That creates a loss of welfare. Welfare, what's that? That's how, uh, how well off the consumer is and how well off also the producer is, right? If we look at them together, if we could get rid of that problem with information, we could make them both better off. In other words, we could make the, pro, uh, the, the marketer just as well off profit-wise and make the consumer uh, better off in terms of being healthier, in terms of eating healthier, making better decisions. Okay? Um, so I want to give you a couple examples sort of back up this theory of, of how things are going. Um, 
Yeah, I recognize. <laughs> okay. First one, uh, sunk cost fallacy. Okay. The, the rational economics tells us people uh, in, a, in an all-you-can-eat restaurant, they've already paid for how much, you know, the, for their food. They now should just eat until they stop enjoying it. Okay. But people have this tendency to really take account of that sunk cost, the, the amount they've spent on that food. And so we tried a little experiment. We, as people were entering a restaurant, we gave people, half of them, 50% off the meal and a free drink. And another half only got the free drink because we wanted to see how that price they paid impacted how much they ate. And to make a long story short, they ended up eating a lot more when they paid more, about 25% more, one slice. This first bar here, 3.1 versus 4.1 slices, and that... Uh, um, in any case, a 25% increase in how much they ate. Uh, but there were some other sort of reasonable and, and interesting reactions. This, this tells us that they really are eating to get their money's worth. But, and I'll skip this result, here we have something else. Uh, the impact of taste, okay? And you look on here, and this is a whole bunch of gibberish numbers that uh, I, I don't expect you to be able to read, but you'll notice something that's significant here uh, that has a whole bunch of stars telling us it's an important relationship when it comes to that taste of the first slice. And what it tells us is if we look within any, any of those treatments, the people who like the pizza more eat less of it. Okay, The people who like the pizza less eat more of it. And this sounds really contradictory. Why in the world would that happen? Well, we find really three significant relationships, and let me give you the explanation here. First, you pay more, you eat more. This is, this is rather obvious. This is the sunk cost fallacy. You need to eat more to get your money's worth. Okay? Uh, you need to eat more to get your money's worth when you've paid more. That's, that's sort of the baseline result. The second one is like it less, eat more. What could drive that? Well, it takes a lot more bad pizza to get your money's worth than it does good pizza. Okay, so you're dissatisfied. I paid a lot for this, and you keep eating. Okay, are people aware of it? Not when you ask them afterwards, but that's what they're doing. And last, we actually find another effect that the more you pay, the less you like it. You set up this expectation of how good it should be, and you pay. When you pay more, you end up uh, not liking it as much as you would have otherwise. Another experiment that I want to tell you about, and. Uh, this one, there were some people here who uh, participated in a few years ago. Uh, we actually took over the trillion. And half the people we had come in, and they got $20 in cash to order from a set of certain items, some that we thought were healthy and some that we thought were not as healthy. Another group of people got a debit card. They had $10 in cash, and they also had $10 on this debit card. And whatever they spent on this debit card, right, they could get the cash back at the end, but they had to wait a couple weeks. And we wanted to see what this would do. Economic theory tells us people with a debit card should spend more. In fact, they didn't. They didn't spend any bit different. But we find this. Look at the calorie consumption. You consume right, more than 50, actually I guess about 50 uh, calories more when you're using this debit card that has this delay in the financial burden that you're going to pay. right? They pay, in other words, cash, I pull the thing out of my pocket, I start counting, and I get my head in the game, and I realize there are trade-offs here, and I eat better foods. And when I'm using my debit card, I consume a lot higher calories. In, in fact, the particular calories come from unhealthy foods. You'll see here, we, we get the card treatment. They have a lot more uh, money spent on unhealthy food versus healthy food relative to the cash treatment and a lot more calories coming from those unhealthy foods. They bought high sugar items. They bought high caffeine items. Uh, and, and in fact, we've done this in schools now and find a similar result. So I want to make sure I leave time for Jennifer so I won't spend too much time on this. I'll probably zip through the next couple slides. Uh, framing. Uh, I'll mention this just because there are probably some of you who might have participated in this experiment last year. We had another experiment. We had people in and we had two different sizes of, of foods, okay? And some were labeled half and some were labeled regular in one treatment. In another treatment, they were exactly the same sizes, but we labeled them regular and double. And we get these dramatic effects where when you label them half and regular, 
nobody buys anything. And when you label them regular and double, everybody buys the regular. In other words, having this large, this thing called double, that makes it sound like it's way out of bounds for you know, what you should eat, legitimizes this smaller amount of food. And when it legitimizes it, people buy a lot more of it. Nobody wants the half, that's too small. And nobody wants to buy the largest amount because you know, that, that's too big. But when you label these correctly, then people start buying, which is why you don't find a small at McDonald's. This is why you don't find the whatever it was, the short at, uh, at Starbucks. They don't sell. They're not useful to them. Okay? I'm going to burn through a couple of these. Uh, essentially, what we find is that the amount of cognitive resources, the amount of stress people are under, help determine whether people really make rational decisions or whether they start relying on these rules of thumb, these more hedonic decisions, decisions based on, is it going to taste good, right? That's, that's what does it. When I'm under stress, I go for the things that are more hedonic. I go for the things that taste good, the chocolate cake rather than the carrots. And here's some math to show you that there's actually a model behind some of this just to make you think I, I know what I'm talking about. Um, if we define foods in a certain way, so we have virtuous foods and we have sinful foods. Virtuous foods are things like carrots where how much we should eat is actually more than we really eat. Sinful foods are those where how much we eat is actually much more than we really should eat from a health perspective. Okay? Then we think about what is the, uh, the marketer's motive in, uh, in actually putting these foods out there. And what you'll find if food placement is in these naturally distracted areas, then it's going to be a lot more profitable to put out sinful foods. A, a fast food restaurant where people are trying to get in and get out and there's a whole bunch of noise and hustle and bustle, they're going to sell uh, sinful foods. They're going to sell foods that you shouldn't eat that much about of because that's what sells. That's what makes a profit there, right? And foods in a much slower environment, much less, much less distracted environment, are going to be much more healthy because that's what sells there. It's not necessarily that food marketers are systematically trying to make people fat, but due to the way the marketplace works, the incentives are created so that that's what gives them the, the, the money. Alternatively, though, they could charge for less distracting environments, or they could charge for foods that facilitate this consumption monitoring, that tell us how much we're eating. And in that way, they can make some profit and still give us a way to make healthier decisions. They can overcome this uh, you know, cognitive resource shortage that we have. The fact that we're so stressed out when we're making our food decisions. Uh, last one's a complicated concept I don't want to talk about. Um, so let me skip to my conclusions. So many of the proposed solutions to this obesity problem are really not likely to have a big effect, particularly on the obese population, which are those who have shown us that they respond less to these cognitive factors and respond more to these other factors. That's what they, I mean, that's how they got there, okay? And I, I know that, <laughs> me being one of them. <laughs> um, the obese, however, may be exactly those who do not respond to these cognitive cues creating an important interaction between marketers and decision makers. In other words, policymakers need to take into account how marketers are going to respond when they put these policies in place. And we may actually see negative reactions, like we've seen with health information, where it's been abused to death to get people to eat things that they really probably shouldn't. The interaction here between economics and psychology is really going to be key. It's really something we need to pay attention to. Now, I... I uh, from this point, I'm supposed to introduce you to uh, Jennifer, Jennifer Noble, uh, re recently married, uh, used to be Jennifer Cole. <laughs> I want to make sure I get that right. She was with the Food and Brand Lab. She'll give you a better introduction of herself, but she wants to uh, talk to you a little bit more about this in practice rather than theory. Thanks. Thanks, Stephen. So just to go back where, ooh, that works. Um, to where David left off or Dr. Jess left off. Um, I'll focus more on the interaction, where were we here? Um, between the decision makers. So that's my position in the Food and Brand Lab. 
I began about a year ago, but I worked with Dr. Wansink, who's my boss. Um, he's currently on a leave of absence from Cornell. He's at the USDA Center for Nutrition Policy and Promotion, so he's in charge of my pyramid and all of those sorts of things. So it's great to be involved with David even before Brian left um, to continue our policy interaction and um, the marketer interaction and even taking that to the next level, which is part of my position as the director of operations to take it to the food companies or um, the crafts, the Wegmans, that sort of crew. So um, thank you again for, I guess, for David for inviting me to come in. So. Um, so what we do at the Food and Brand Lab, how many of you have heard of the Food and Brand Lab? We've been here since about 2005. Great. Um, how many of you think you've been involved in a study by the Food and Brand Lab? Or may have been in a study, I'm not sure if you were in the Food and Brand Lab. <laughs> Great. So part of what we do is um, help people use food to be who they want to be. Um, we have our own kind of think tank powerhouse um, that consists of a postdoc, um, students that are actually um, involved in building a research topic and kind of taking it from start um, the concept, contacting the company that we may or may not work with, um, building a questionnaire, um, and then finally having the results that have the equations that make you look really smart. Um, and then we also have full-time employees like myself. Um, there are three of us that are currently taking the studies from start to finish. Um, so what we do whenever we set up the studies, it can be anywhere between having a hidden camera in the lab, which um, in 110 Warren Hall, we have our own laboratory that has a full, fully functioning work, working kitchen. Um, and there are three cameras in there. So if you've ever been involved in a study with us that was actually in the lab, you may or may not have been on camera. Um, we also work with restaurants. They're always looking for ways to make money, not waste food, um, have those win-win situations, which is where we kind of come in, not really in a consulting capacity because we don't want to be known as the people that worked on only with craft. Um, we want to be independent and be someone that can kind of hold hands with everyone and make sure everyone is looked out for. Um, we also have a consumer panel of about 3,400 people. Um, last year for our website we had over 30,000 people that have been on it. Um, what we do is study the effects on individual behaviors. We kind of um, look at the different environmental influences that may affect you and your consumption. So the lights are off right now. David mentioned before, um, you may eat more when your lights are off in your home. So we'll actually quantify how much more you may eat whenever your lights are off. Um, so clearly the obesity and poor nutrition and over the years, the diseases have been occurring. He had the stats earlier. Um, using our lab, using the consumer panels, um, our field studies and restaurants, our interviews that we may have one-on-one -on -one with people, and then going through the data and mining all of that, we uh, explain the different hidden persuaders that may affect your everyday life. So I think it's really a new concept for people to say, okay, it's not me. It's all of these other excuses. But, I mean, it's not even an excuse. It's, oh, that, ex that explains it. If I'm eating off of a 12-inch plate, I'm going to serve myself more food than if I were eating off of a 10-inch plate. So we actually quantify what that amount would be. Um, so one of my roles at the Food and Brand Lab is um, focusing on the win-win strategies, working with companies that may contact us. Um, we find ways that we can market products, um, such as the 100-calorie pack. Brian actually came up with that when he was at Illinois and spent probably six months going to different companies saying, you know, if you have these 100 calories, people have a cue saying stop eating because you're going to continue eating. It's like eating out of the bag of chips. You're going to keep eating unless you put it in a bowl and actually have an end, which would be your bowl is empty. Um, it actually wasn't a successful adoption for many years, and I think actually in 2002 a lot of companies began coming out with that. So one great thing about doing primary research is you're probably the first one to find it. One of the cons of doing that is maybe the companies aren't actually willing to adopt it. So that's part of my role, getting people to see how they can have these win-win scenarios. So I currently have worked with schools. Um, I've worked with children that are aged three to five and helped incorporate more fruits and vegetables into their life. Um, we gave them stickers and snacks and renamed the foods. Um, I work with companies, and obviously now we're working with the government on things. So, 
So whenever a company contacts me, I think, okay, what are we going to focus on? Um, so the more recent one that I was speaking with a company about was, okay, um, we're looking at the culture change. Um, people are getting older. We have this new Generation Y that's coming in. What are their consumption um, norms? What, um, what can we use to target at this big g- generation gap? So we'll sit down and um, think about the principles and practical tools that they can be the leader in the industry, and we'll go through the options and create a plan. Um, so, for example, like I was saying, we discussed culture. I'll go through this quickly, too. Um, things that are currently changing right now, the media. Um, like David was saying, you know, we're sitting in front of the TV more, not getting as much exercise. Um, we're looking at the millennials and baby boomers. Um, but we're also in a new generation, and we need to make sure that these this younger generation is aware of, of the understanding of food. Like, do they know what the nutrition labeling facts are actually telling them? Um, we have to think about sustainability, the globalization, um, and how much people are actually spending on dining out um, and how much more they may be consuming when they're dining out. Um, and there's this new natural, global, local, which is very well known in Ithaca. Um, many people are thinking more about health and wellness, um, especially because more and more people are becoming obese. And, of course, right now the most recent topic is the economy. So it's kind of pulling all of these things together um, to think about how everyone can be benefited and, and be successful. Um, it, whenever we think about any kind of new um, relationship, we always look at, I like to look at um, the Who Moved My Cheese book. It's very simple, which is the concept that we use in the Food and Brand Lab. What simple changes can you make in your life that um, you can anticipate change, you can um, take action, you can be responsible for your decisions? Um, so then we take it back a step again and think about the mindless eating philosophy and how that is effect- ahead of the culture curve. I mean, just looking at a couple of, of examples with the all-you-can-eat pizza um, I have on here the Subway McDonald's, and this is the Health Halo, which is another thing that um, David just had discussed shortly. If you can see that small, it doesn't really matter. But basically, <laughs> whenever you look at a potential diner at Subway, they think that they're eating healthily. They've got all these fruits and ve- or the vegetables on their sandwich. But then they think, okay, I'm healthy. I may just get that soda. And if I'm just getting the soda, I have all these vegetables, I think... If I get the chips, I'll still be okay. So they're grossly underestimating the calories that they're consuming, whereas people at McDonald's know what they're getting themselves into. So someone at Subway has nearly as many calories as they would at McDonald's, um, but they don't even think of it that way. So whenever you're looking at someone that ate healthy for lunch, they're probably going to consume more calories that evening when they go home because they still have in their head that they ate very healthily. Um, earlier in the day. So then, you know, you have extra calories that your body didn't necessarily need. So what we try to focus on also in the Food and Brand Lab is looking at small changes that can make big differences. And even just 50 calories per day, um, plus or minus, can be a difference in five pounds per year. So what we'd really try to do is identify ways that people can use this to their benefit. Like, it's not a diet. It's something small, simple, that they can implement in their own lives without having to track calories. Um, but what, what we really, I mean, we're not a diet, so we just focus on it being a gradual problem, and it's also a gradual solution. Um, to go back to what David mentioned earlier, the nutritional gatekeeper, the person that may not be looking at how the price of food is increasing, but they're the ones that are in charge of 73% of what your household is purchasing. Um, I don't know if you think about that, like if who the, per- the person is in your household that purchases the food, but you have a lot of power over what ends up inevitably on the plate of the people in the rest um, in your household. Um, just thinking about that responsibility in that respect. Um, the Subway and McDonald's is also the Health Halos example that we already mentioned. Um, from the results of all of the 250 studies that we've done so far in the Food and Brand Lab. Um, We've set up a website that um, you can go through and take a quiz and even self-monitor yourself. Um, Part of the the reason that diets fail, which is why we're not a diet, is people don't stay focused on it, um, and they need that regular feedback, whether that's a coach or um, even people that exercise. It's always great to have 
um, that person that meets you at the gym every day and says, hey, how's everything going? So what we're doing with the National Mindless Eating Challenge, it's a tool that you can log into online, um, enter in part of what your danger zones may be, and we've identified at least five. Um, there's the meal stuffer. That's the person that sits down at the table and is with their pregnant wife and eats four extra rolls. Um, the snack grazer, the person that goes to a party that um, tries all the different foods that are available. The party binger, who is, can also be the snack binger. I mean, all of these kind of relate to one another. The restaurant indulger, and that can easily be fixed if a relationship begins with a restaurant that is willing to switch to a smaller plate and maybe charge people more for a smaller plate. Um, because I don't know how many times you go to the restaurant now and bring home a doggy bag. That's, you don't, it's not necessary. You could be charged less, which would also be more. Well, any, anyway, there's all of these different, we sit around all day and think about ways to set up a study. Um, and then you also have the desktop diner. Um, I don't know how many times in the past month I have sat in front of my desk and eaten my lunch. Um, it's just great to be aware of that so that you can make small changes in your life. So if you actually log into the National Mindless Eating Challenge website, um, it'll give you um, recommendations based on what you think your diet danger zone is. So from that, for example, if you say that you are a desktop diner or whatever your diet danger zone is, it will give you three tips. Um, and the way I kind of apply that as well is if there's a wellness program within a company that we're working with, like this is another great tool to provide, um, I guess, supplemental evidence to support what they're doing. Um, if they already have a wellness program that encourages them to take 10,000 steps a day and eat five cups of fruits and vegetables, this is something else that reminds them, listen, this is important. We want you to be successful, and you'll feel better about yourself if you make small changes in your life. Um, so since most of you are students, um, we have a semester, a two-semester course that we take in the fall and spring. Um, there's kind of a, an admissions process to get in, but we currently have 15 students that help out with that. And you can also be involved in a study with Leader Lab. Susan um, can sign up for it, but I think most of you have signed up for that before. But we also have this new initiative that we're beginning, and I've discussed it a few times. Um, if you go to smallplatemovement.org, we have different initiatives that we're beginning to target the restaurant to target um, magazines that may want to share the information, to target the home, to target um, plate manufacturers, so that they would agree to, if they already manufacture plates, to maybe get a small plate movement stamp on their plate saying this is approved. Um, because one of our studies have shown that if you switch, like I said, to a 12 inch from a 12 inch plate to a 10 inch plate, you'll eat 20 percent fewer calories. And part of I mean, just to go back to one of the research results that we had, you may have the same amount of food, but you may have a more calorie-dense menu. So it's, it's going to be a process, but if we just begin with getting rid of two inches um, and set up a challenge beginning January 1st, it'd be great to see just how simple, small things can make great changes in your life. So I think that was it. So those are the websites that we have. So uh, from there, I guess we move to uh, questions and answers. Uh, I guess, Jennifer, if you'll join me at the table. Yeah. Uh, is there anybody who has questions regarding our, uh, the work, what we've presented, anything else? We'd be happy to answer them. I guess we have 10 minutes for that. Uh-huh. <laughs> yes? So um, some... Communities are thinking of taxing unhealthy food. Is that an effective um, policy, or is there the implication that we? So I, I've, there are actually several that are, are thinking along these lines, and I think a few that have actually instituted it. Um, I, my guess is that it won't be particularly effective uh, because of the way it's going to be instituted. It, it will probably, you know, get people to substitute one particular type of bad food for another particular type of bad food. But I, I don't think it would be very effective, particularly uh, given the research I've seen, to tax all bad foods and try and get them to avoid all of them. 
people just aren't that sensitive to price changes along those lines. So if there are two identical items and I'm, ch you know, or, or things that are equally bad or desirable, and I'm taxing one, fine, that's going to switch me over to this one, but it's not going to change my my behavior that much overall. Yes. <laughs> Go ahead. Well, um, sure, sure. Uh, how have our eating habits changed since uh, since we've begun studying this? Part of part of what I do, I just have tall, skinny glasses, and I generally serve myself off of my um, my salad plate for dinner. Um, just because you have to live what you te preach, right? Um, but also whenever I have a dinner at home and it's um, a family style kind of setup, I only put my vegetables on the table. That way if I am you know, sitting at the table and still enjoying the conversation, I'm going to eat something that has good calories in it um, rather than the bread or pasta or dessert or anything like that. Um, the I would like to think that <laughs> my patterns changed a lot, but it's more just being aware of those small things that I can control um, rather than having seven scoops of ice cream. So do, within uh, my household, I, my wife plays the role of the gatekeeper, so I think essentially what's happened is I now tell her about these behavioral effects and these ways that we can change to make things better, and she says, that's nice, and that's, that's about <laughs> where it ends. <laughs> <laughs> Other questions? Yes? Um, are there stockpiling on the graphic you had up? Because there have been research specifically on that, like on the effects of people buying in bulk and having all those things in their house. So, so the, yeah, so the question is whether there's been research on the effects of stockpiling. And uh, yes, there's actually been a, a pretty good amount done. Uh, and, and what you find is sort of what you would expect. You know, if, if you stockpile a whole bunch of food, right after you stockpile it, you're going to start consuming a lot of it. It's, it's sort of like the all-you-can-eat effect. You eat a lot more of it. That tapers off after a while, right? So if, if you have a large, large stockpile of long-term, long-term it's not going to have that big of an impact. And it also depends somewhat on what the food is, right? If it's something that's, you know, something that tastes really good, yeah, it's going to increase it a lot. If you're, you're stockpiling something you don't like to eat and don't eat normally, it's going to have no impact on what you do. So the, you have to be a little bit careful how you frame it. But yeah, stockpiling does have an impact. Yes? Um, what kind of device did you have for like, college students who like, are meal planning? Did you have all the things you used to choose from? Most of us go to you know, the bathroom. So, uh, so what advice would I have for college students who are on meal plans? Um, well, so it's difficult, right? Because you're almost always going to be eating away from your home. Uh, you're a lot of the time going to be eating in places that are really noisy and distracting. And, and to boot, you have this card that has some insane amount of money on it to eat for the whole year. And, and, uh, and you know, it, it just naturally tends to make you eat more than you would normally. Uh, I, I think making efforts to try and eat in smaller groups or off of the normal times when people are frequenting the dining halls or, or the, you know, the cafes might help a little bit. Uh, it, it might also help a little bit if you were to use cash instead of using your card. We, we've got the data on that now mm -hmm. from from Cornell, <laughs> <laughs> so we know that. Uh, but there, you know, little things like that could help. That could help uh, um, you know, sort of curb on the edge how much you're eating. But it is difficult, really difficult. Yes. Uh, well, so, the, uh, so is it worse to eat, overeat healthy foods or uh, not overeating with, with less than healthy foods? Uh, so I don't know. There might be a nutritionist here somewhere who'd be uh, better equipped to answer that than I would. Uh, I, I think by definition, overeating is a bad thing. <laughs> um, but that's, that's sort of, I don't know, a tautology, right? Uh, people tend not to really want to give up the bad things that they're eating. It really takes a lot to get them to give those up. They are a lot more likely and a lot more willing to add good foods in. So, well, I don't really have a good thing to say about which one is better. 
Um, I, I can tell you with regularity, people tend not to give up those bad things. They tend to overeat on the good things and feel good about themselves for it, right? By just adding in those things. You know, you, a diet that's uh, going to get you to be overweight with a salad tacked on is not going to do much better for you, <laughs> right? That, that's, that's sort of the key. Yes? Um, I'm not sure if it was a study actually involved with this, but I know they've changed like the sizes of trays in the dining hall. Like you can choose from the old ones and the new ones. Do you think the size of the tray also depends how much like a person is willing to eat? Um, Jennifer, do you have a... That, well, that's yeah. actually something that we're also looking to long-term with the small plate movement, making the trays even smaller um, within the schools. Uh, we don't, I don't personally know of any data on on how much you would eat less, but I'm guessing I mean you can fit fewer plates on a smaller tray. So you would either be going up four seconds, and you may not want to do that. Or I'm not really sure how, what the size of the trays are to to know, but I'm guessing does it have like the angle on each end too, so it slides around better. So I think it's more of a just more conducive for its environment in that case. But I'm sure that had we known that they were changing it, we would have been all about doing a study on that. <laughs> yes? Um, with some of this mindless eating stuff, when people become mindful of it, like let's say I started to buy the tall, skinny glasses to drink out of because I knew I would consume less, has there been any work on the long-term effect of that? Well, because I know I'm drinking less, does that mean I'll give myself a second glass or... Once you become mindful of it, is it still a successful tool? There's the questions about the long-term effects of some of these uh, behavioral tricks that we're talking about. Uh, that's really one of the weaknesses of using an experimental paradigm in that we get to experiment and find what people are doing over a very short period of time. And what happens longer term is really hard to pin down, mm -hmm. right? It, it takes uh, you know, more longitudinal data, those sorts of things. So that's a real weakness. It's a real weakness. Uh, with that particular one, I don't know. But there are some of these where after running our experiments and finding this result, we can then go back and look in less controlled circumstances and see if there's a similar result. Now, with the, the less controlled circumstances, you don't have the, you can't discern causality the same way you can with the experiments. But you can see if, if it makes sense with that result over a longer term. For example, the debit card result holds up over a longer term uh, from from at least the initial results we've seen on data. And and, and so it's, I mean, it's going to do you better if you, over time, start switching to using cash and counting out your cash at the cash register rather than swiping a card every time. I don't know about classes, though. <laughs> <laughs> but that is something that we do track with the Na National Mindless Eating Challenge. And we also have, um, I guess we do have a consultant, but it's not us, that is beginning to... Um, um, that outreach for a longer term plan that would provide phone support and ask questions for the people that are involved in that at a company. Um, so in, in due time we'll have more and more, but we are analyzing the data that we've been doing the challenge for the past, I think since January 2006. So it's not a long, long term because whenever you think of long term it's at least five years. So I mean the book hasn't even been out that long. So, But we'd like to have that and share that someday. That'd be a great journal article. It, it looks like our time is just about up for question and answer session. Probably take one more question if you've got it. Yes? Um, it seems like a lot of this has been brought up in the United States. Has any of it been applied internationally? Uh, so there, there is an experimental literature that has you know, done things in other countries as well. Um, I, I don't... You know, so. Brian Watson and I have batted around the idea of actually trying this in, in uh, a developing country context because it, it really does seem like the, the factors driving obesity in, in a developing country have to be very different and, and the cultural cues have to create you know a lot of different results. In, in a sense, that's another real limit here is, is we've got a very narrow subject base, right? We're, we're looking at uh, people in the U.S., and, and for the most part, we're looking at Cornell students, which are, are not necessarily representative of the United States, right? Uh, but are these things really going to apply in other settings? We have no idea, and that's something that really is uh, it, it's necessary sort of in the next step uh, to be able to figure that out. Are these general principles or just narrowly applicable? 
There was a, a study on the French paradox that was recently right. released that um, Brian gathered data while he was on sabbatical in France, um, just observing the, or even asking questions of um, restaurant um, visitors that um, asked them when they knew when to stop eating. And it was more internal, like the food no longer tasted good, um, the food was cold, I'm not hungry anymore, and compared that to Chicagoans. And they said, I stopped eating when the TV show was over, um, when it went to commercial, when my plate was empty. So, I mean, there, on some scale it has, but on, in the grand scheme of things, there's still so much to do in that respect. Thank you.